I'm glad to be home. I, I definitely appreciate uh, Brother Leland uh, stepping in and filling in last week, and, and Brian on Wednesday, and Troy this morning. So everybody's kind of, it's kind of, everybody's gone. It's like everybody shuffles into spots and, and helps out. Um, that's a blessing, though. Um, I, I can, I've, I've had opportunity to reminisce over the last uh, several months with Chris and Joe, kind of thinking back on how this work started as they get prepared to start a new work in, in some prayer. And I can remember, you know, if like one person was gone, like everything came to a screeching halt. You know, it was like, what do we do now? But it's, it's a blessing to see folks that are, that are blessed and talented and gifted and, and willing to step in and, and, and help out. So definitely, definitely appreciate that. Um, I just want to say thank you personally um, to, to many of you that were here Wednesday night with Brian. Um, I almost have to clarify, um, it sounded a little uh, self-serving. Heather... Uh, Facebooked a little thing and said, hey, Brian, thanks for leading us Wednesday night and putting us into action. And I didn't know what he was doing, so I hit like, thinking, well, that's awesome. Little did I know when I got back, what he had people do was write letters to me that were just encouraging. And so it sounded a little self-serving, like I liked that they were doing that. I didn't know that was happening. Um, but I'm, I'm so grateful. Um, matter of fact, I, when I got home, I, I started to open up some of the letters and I had to put them away because... I was, uh, I, read, I read through the rest of them, but I, I, at that moment, it was just overwhelming to me. Thank you so much. I, I don't even know how to express um, how just encouraging that is. Um, so, uh, this morning, um, we're going to rejoin our series over the last few weeks, and kind of on and off, we've kind of been, which is kind of nice in this series. This is one of those that, like, it doesn't have to happen every single week. It's kind of some break in between it. We've been talking about um, just... Good words or, or impactful words that begin with the, the letters R-E, re. Because there's actually a lot of them in Scripture when you start to look. And we won't do all of them. So those of you that are worried about that, we won't do all like 700 re words in the Bible. But there's a few that to me are just, I don't know, resonate. There's another R-E word um, that just kind of speak to me. And, and I guess maybe just where I'm at in my life and, and, and God pressing that on my heart and, and so I, I, I figure a lot of times messages, if, if you haven't figured that out yet, um, a lot of times God just is working in my life on some stuff. And I figure, well, if he's working on my life with some stuff, maybe he's working on other people's life with some of the same things, that we're all kind of struggling or, or dealing with some of the similar things. And if we're not, we're all human, so if you're not struggling with that stuff right now, you probably will be. Or maybe you're, you're beyond it. Maybe you've already kind of wrestled with that stuff. God's shown you what you needed to learn, and you've moved on, and so now you're in a position to help the rest of us kind of start to, to work through some of these things. But, but spend a, a couple quick minutes. We'll review. There's another R-E word. And then um, wait, we need somebody just taking count of how many R-E words we used this morning. That would be fun. You can somebody kind of tweet that later. 700 R-E words this morning. Um, but here's where we'll start. Anybody remember what our first R-E word was? Yeah, there you go. All right. So, yeah, we said... And we said a couple of things about the word remember. One of the things, and, and maybe you jotted this down and you remember, anybody remember how many times this word or a, a, the root word shows up? Because it's not always remember. Sometimes the word is memorial or memory, but it's all kind of the same root word. Anybody remember about how many times that shows up in Scripture? Huh? No. 397. 397 times God tells us to remember. Which would mean what to you? Probably important. If I told you something once every single day and more than once on a few days when you were just kind of not checked in, you would think that we probably should remember this. And so 397 times God talks to us about the importance of remembering. And here's some of the things he tells us. And we just we narrowed it down to just like a couple of key things. Remembering God's faithfulness in the past allows us to trust him in the present. Right? That's so key. And, and if, we, if we don't you know, remember anything else about the lesson on remembering, remember that. All right? Remember that. That remembering God's faithfulness in the past allows us to trust Him in the present. God doesn't want us to just kind of, you know, eyes blind and ears covered, just jumping into things. He says, hey, look what I've done in the past in your life. Based on that, you can trust me. And if, even if you don't have a point of reference for that particular thing, and some of us don't, right? It's a journey. So sometimes we encounter stuff, we bump up against stuff that we just haven't encountered yet. But what's great about God and the way he works is there's certainly reference in Scripture we can go back to and go, well, there's an example of that. 
And you know what's even greater? Not, not even greater than God's word, but you know what he couples alongside that? People that have probably been through it. That, that God's worked that through in their life and they could come alongside and say, hey, here's what happened with us when we kind of bumped up against this. And, and, and I'll, I don't know about you, but a lot of my examples about that are here's how God worked and here's what not to do when God's working. Those, those are a lot of the lessons I kind of tend to share because uh, for whatever reason, God, he, he's, he's having to work overtime in my life often in areas here. The other thing that he tells us about remembering his faithfulness is that by remembering God's faithfulness in the past, it directs our actions for the future. So he says, if you can remember what I've done, and that allows you to face your present situation, then you start preparing and taking action for what you expect and what you believe I'm going to do. That's called faith, right? That's called faith. When we started stepping out and going, okay, God, you haven't completely illuminated the path, but based on what you've done in my past, I'm facing this present situation, and I'm going to step forward trusting your faithfulness and your love and your grace. And we do that. And we, the, one of the stories we talked about was the story of David. Remember David and Goliath? And remember David says, hey, I remember when I was in the field taking care of my dad's sheep, and when a lion came or a bear came, I took it on, I whipped it, and so this guy, this giant, I'm going to take him on as well. And so that sounds great. That's David remembering a lot, and now he's facing a present situation. He's in that moment. But then what does he do? Does David all talk? What does he do? Takes action, right? He goes and he takes action. So remembering God's faithfulness in the past allowed him to face the present situation, but it caused him to start taking action for the future. He went and picked up how many stones? Five. Five. And I, I always wonder about that. You know, why the five, right? If, if you really believe God could take care of this guy with, and he, his faith was in God, his trust was in God, and why doesn't he just pick up one rock? Why does he pick up five? Four brothers. Four brothers. That's faith, man. That's taking action that starts to line out at your future. It says, not only am I trusting God for this, I'm trusting God for beyond this. He had no idea who was coming back over the top of that hill after Goliath went down. But he was ready. Based on what? His ability? Based on God's strength and faithfulness. So those are, those are important things. Remember we talked about it? Remember we talked about in this day and time, Christians, you guys, we live in a world and we live in a time and you, we all live in circumstances that just batter us and, and it feels like they just pull us away and defeat us and knock us down and suck the energy and the life right out of us. And, 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 and one of the things that we need in this day and time is, and we talked about this a few weeks ago, was Christian swag. Remember that? What does it stand for? Anybody remember? What does swag stand for? Standing with Almighty God. It's not, it's not swag in the sense that the young people kind of use it today, where you've got swag and it means you're confident, you're, you know, whatever, and it's all about you. We need the kind of swag that David had that said, you know what, I'm going to go take this guy on because I know who my God is. I'm going to take on this, this difficulty because I know who my God is. I'm going to take on this challenge because I know who my God is. And that's what David does. And so we talked about a couple of very practical biblical ways to help us remember God's faithfulness. And here they are. One, write it down. I don't know about you, but if I don't start writing stuff down, I forget. I just do. It happens a lot. I, you, you think I'm joking. I actually carry a pad into the shower. Not like in the shower because it will get everything wet. But, um, but I, like it's in the bathroom. And sometimes, you know, just showering up and it's like, and I have, I'm like reaching out and writing stuff down because otherwise I forget. But in this situation, write it down. Whenever God does something and you see God do something that just, him, you know it's him, jot it down, document it somehow. I mean, maybe take a picture, do whatever. Um, the other thing is tell others. When you get to tell your story, you know what it does? It encourages the heart of the hearer, but it encourages the heart of the teller. I've, I've had an opportunity the last few months to rehearse God's faithfulness to us here at Cornerstone when talking to Chris and Joe about what they're getting ready to do. I've had, I've had that story rehearsed so many times, and each time I tell it, I just swell up inside. And not because of what we've done, but because of who God is and what he's done. Tell others. That's what Tammy did that, that Sunday. You guys remember? Stepped aside, and Tammy stepped up, and she shared the way God had just opened up doors and, and answered prayer. And, and so write it down. Tell others. Another great example of the principle of remembering scripture for us in the story of the prodigal son. You guys remember that story? 
You remember the story, the prodigal son, most of you are familiar with it, right? Two, guy, two sons, a dad. The younger son says, hey, give me all my stuff, dad, and I'm out of here. Actually, give me all the stuff that I'm supposed to get when you're dead, which is really, actually, that was incredibly offensive. In a sense, he's kind of conveying to his dad, I just assume you not be here anymore so I can get my stuff. And the dad, which, how many of you dads would go, if your, if your kid comes up to you and says, hey, dad, I just want all my stuff. I don't really care that you're around anymore. I just want the stuff I'm supposed to get before you die. Can I get it now? How many of you dads would go, okay, here you go. This dad did. This dad does. He gives him everything that was supposed to be portioned to him, and he takes it, and what does he do with it? Squanders it. Just lives wastefully. I mean, spends it on, on you know, I, I would say, you know, the old saying, fast cars, fast women, that kind of stuff. They didn't have cars back then, but, you know, fast donkeys and, and, and whatever. I mean, he just, he spins it just with, without, without any thinking. I mean, he's just, he's just out of his head. And he gets to the point where he's just, he's, you know, and, and how, many, how many people, maybe you've been in a place where, you know, you were the person, you're the person people flock to because you had the charisma or you had the money or you had the whatever it was. And it's interesting how people just gather around when you got that stuff. It's amazing how many people gather around when you don't got that stuff. And that's where he finds himself alone, right? And sitting in a pig pen, slopping hogs and saying, you know what? I'm hungry enough to just eat when I'm feeding them. And what happens at that moment? What happens there? And we don't know how long he'd been doing that, by the way. We, we don't know how long this whole thing took to transpire. It's a story, right? Jesus was telling a story. What happens after that? You remember? Yeah, I love that. Verse 17 of Luke 15. Um, If if you want to read it or or whatever, if not, I'll read it for you here real quick. Verse 17 says this, and it's so incredibly powerful when we're talking about remembering. Look what he says. It says, when he came to his senses, when this young son finally woke up, smelled the coffee, looked around, it says, he said, how many of my father's hired hands have more than enough food, and here I am dying with hunger? What did he do? He remembered his father. He remembered how gracious and good his father was. Anyone anyone remember what he did next? He got up, and he went back right? He headed toward home. He headed toward his father. In other words, what did he do? He repented. He repented. We talked about this incredible concept that God speaks about more than a hundred times in scripture. And there were four main points that I wanted us to understand. We're going to, we're going to buzz through these and then we're going to push on and, and wrap up this morning real quick. Here's the things we need to really make sure we understand when it comes to the word and the concept and the idea of repentance. Because for many people, the word repent is a just, uh, I don't know, it's a polarizing word. When people say repent, it, it, if, if you were raised in church or raised around church, especially if you were raised in or around a very conservative church, when the word repent gets said, it usually gets shouted and people recoil. That is not what this is about. That's not what that word even means. It doesn't mean recoil. It doesn't mean hide and and take cover. What it actually, and and, and so we're going to talk about it. Repentance, here it is. Here's the first thing we talked about. Repentance is not God wanting you to feel like a failure. And I think a lot of people, I don't know about you, some of the churches I grew up in, that's the way it was presented. You're scum, you're not worth anything, you're horrible, you've messed up again, you've blown it again, your life is a mess, you, you're, you're not going to add up to anything. And repent got, got, kind of got just, sh- you know, just laid on you like this heavy weight that you'll never measure up because you're a consistent, constant failure. That is not the meaning of repentance. That is not what God's trying to convey when he says repent. It's not your Heavenly Father hoping and wanting you to make you feel like a failure. How many loving dads, we talked about this a few weeks ago, as a loving parent, if you're a parent and you've got kids, how many of you get joy from walking around making sure your kids feel like a failure? Isn't that an awesome relationship? Isn't dinner time so great when when you just make them feel like they're never enough? That's not what repentance is. It's not about just laying a heavy weight on you. Matter of fact, it's, it's just the opposite, quite honestly. Repentance, it is a change. It's a change in our thinking. It's, a, it, it's, it's, it's the difference between worldly sorrow, 
which lets me look at my sin from my perspective. And worldly sorrow, all it, do, all it does is it brings back death and separation because worldly sorrow just makes me feel guilty and I feel bad. And the thing I feel bad about the most is the consequences of the sin, not what it's doing to my relationship with God. I just feel bad about what it's causing me. Worldly sorrow is all about me. And when it's all about you, you're quickly on a road to separation from the relationship God really wants with you. Because he's no longer God, you are. Because all you're worried about is you. So that's what worldly sorrow does. But he says godly sorrow brings about life and salvation. That that's what true repentance is. It's that godly sorrow that says, hey, I'm going to look at my sin from God's perspective. Those of you that are parents, I think you can really, really relate to this. You ever have something, ever have something happen and, and maybe your kids did something and it, man, it just shook you to the core. I mean, it disappointed you and it hurt you. What did you, what did you want more than anything right then? I want that relationship restored. It wasn't about, you know, we're not perfect parents. So unfortunately, sometimes as, as parents, anger bubbles up. And, and instead of looking for a restoration of relationship, we want to make sure we lay some guilt on for a little while. But that's not what God's really doing. He wants, he says the biggest problem here isn't the consequences you're facing. The biggest problem here is the distance that's, that's taking place between you and me. And I want you back. I want you back. I want you to come home. Anybody remember the Greek word? Here's a good test. Anybody remember the Greek word for, for uh, repent? Metanoia, absolutely, which simply means it was a military term that they used. It was a military term that they used with the Roman army because it was a Greek-speaking world at the time. It's a Greek word, but they used in the Roman army, and it meant basically what we would use as about face. It's the same word. It's the same word. Stop the direction you're going. Change your mind about the direction you're going. Turn around and go the other way, and that's what it means. So not only is repentance a, a change of mind, but it's also a change of direction. Back to the prodigal son, right? Back to that story. It says that he came to his senses. Was that enough? Was that, would that have brought his relationship with that father back to where it needed to be? That if he sat in a pig pen and went, I don't like the pig pen, my dad is gracious and he's good, was that enough? No. What did he have to do? He had to act on it. So not only did he have to change his mind, he had to change his direction. He had to do something. And so he begins the journey home. He home. And so repentance is a change in thinking that leads to a change in direction. And ultimately, true repentance restores relationship. True repentance. Now, we talked a little bit about that worldly sorrow. That doesn't restore your relationship because you're still stuck in what, how you feel and the consequences that sin is bringing into your life. You're not real concerned about how your father feels and where he desires you to be because he loves you and he wants you there. So this morning, I want to talk to you a little bit about a new reword and, and on our journey here. And here's the word. The word is renew. The word is renew. Let me ask you, when you hear the word renew, what do you think of? And, and it's just us, so just you can talk back. We can dialogue this morning. What do you think of when you hear the word renew? Make new? Explain that. How do you, what do you think? Before it expires, right? Before it's, it's, before it's no longer valid, right? That, that point, and, and hopefully you do it before the expiration and, and, and stuff, because if you do it after the expiration, you they might let you renew it, but you've got to pay something now. Yeah, that's anybody else? What do you think of when you think of the of renew? Refreshing, start over. Yeah, I, I kind of those are some a lot of the, here's some of the words that 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 kind of uh, Yeah, I think of something that's that's been once has been kind of bright and bold and vibrant that's now dull. I, I guess just my mind kind of goes there. I watch too much HGTV or whatever, you know, when they kind of like remodel stuff and renew stuff. That's what I think of. Stuff that had a, was probably new at one time, but is now in kind of disrepair or, 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 or you know, kind of just, I don't know, just shabby. And somebody comes in and, and kind of cleans it up, uh, cha- you know, re- reworks it, redoes it. Here's some of the other words that I, I kind of associate. Remodel, refurbish, renovate, 
rejuvenate. These are all words that I think kind of probably fit into that idea of renew. How many, let me, you don't have to raise your hand because I don't want to embarrass you this morning, but how many of you, if you were really super honest this morning, could say, you know what, I, I could use some renewal. I could use some renewal right now. Did you know that God is the greatest remodeler, refurbisher, renovator, rejuvenator, renewer there is? You know why that is? Because only he has life in his breath. Only he can breathe life into things that have just been worn out and stressed out and checked out and and everything. Only he has that ability. Only he has that power. So I want to share with you, if I can, three areas. And I know there's probably so many more we could touch on. But let me just share with you three areas of life where God wants to renew us. And then I want to finish with a story this morning and, and, and we'll be done. First of all, God wants to renew our spirit. He wants to renew our spirit. And some of you that maybe aren't real, you know, kind of the spiritual lingo may go, well, what does that really mean? You ever, you ever just felt kind of down? And maybe, and, and, and we're going to talk about this in a second, some of it's we're thinking, but you ever, you ever had those moments where you just feel like, you feel like you're just inconsistent and, and you're down and, and, and you're just struggling and, and weak and tired and those kinds of things? Have you ever felt that way, kind of spiritually? Like maybe things aren't even really going super bad, but you're just kind of in that funk. My, my, my grandfather used to call it a rut, and I, th- I think I've shared this before. He said a rut is nothing more than an open-ended grave. That's what he said it is. It's a place that we get into and we just kind of sit down, and often if we don't get out, that's where we sit and die of sorts. We disconnect and we detach from people and from, from God. Um, you ever been there? How many, I'll do this, because I think we're all human and we're honest. How many have, how many have ever been there? Just spiritually just sapped, wiped out. Good. And only you're like, why? You're in pretty good company. You're in great company, actually. Guys like Moses and Abraham. And man, how, how can you not talk about spiritual weakness or tiredness or fatigue without talking about Elijah and David? And I want you to listen to, to this, because all of those guys experienced moments, all these people in scriptures experienced moments when they were spiritually spent and detached or felt like they had completely blown it, like things just hadn't gone well and they hadn't made good decisions in the middle of these things and, and they were just, they felt spiritually defeated. And I want you to listen to David's heart's cry in Psalm 51.10. Look what he says. He says, Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. And, I, we've, and I, we've read, I, we, we used to sing this song when I was young. It was a, there was a song that went to it, and it was a pretty song. And, I, and unfortunately, here's, here's one of those things. This was not a pretty song that David wrote. I, I'm pretty certain the melody to this song wasn't this beautiful flowing melody. It was a screaming and a crying of a heart that said, Create in me a clean heart. And it's not, oh God, it's, oh God. And renew a steadfast spirit with it. I share with you a couple things on, about this that just popped out to me as I read this verse. First of all, David cried out to God. He went to the right source. David went to the right source. David craved cleansing and renewal. Do you see that? Create in me a what? A clean heart, oh God, and renew. He craved cleansing and renewal. In that order. And the problem that we have a lot of times is we get the order reversed. I want to feel good. I want to be renewed. I want to be rejuvenated. But God, I don't really want to bear my heart and have you do kind of a cleanup project first. Have you, have you guys seen a commercial? I don't know what the name of the company is. Where they say, hey, put an old tub or put a new tub over your old tub. Have you ever seen that? I, 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 I'm, I'm probably going to offend somebody now. Please don't be offended. But no way. That's nasty. Like, because maybe there's stuff underneath there that needs to be cleaned out first. Don't you think that? I mean, like, what if there's mold and fungus there? And we just kind of, well, let's just drop a new tub over the old one. That'll make it better. Not if there's water leaking back behind it and the subfloor is rotting out and the next time somebody goes sitting in the tub, you're in the basement. Not working out. Not a good idea. But maybe, I'm sorry if I offended somebody. I apologize. 
your, your tub is probably awesome. <laughs> but he goes to the right source. He goes to God and he craves the right things. And what does he not want changed? What does David not address? What does he not talk about when he goes to God and says, hey, create in me a clean heart and renew a, a steadfast spirit where? Within me. So guess what David doesn't pray for when he's seeking a way out of this depression, this, this deep rut. Guess what he doesn't pray for? He doesn't pray for God to show up and change his circumstances. Will God make this better? Will God change that person? He, he, doesn't, he doesn't cover up. Why not? He'd already tried that. If anybody know when this psalm was written, what it was written about? Bathsheba. Bathsheba. You know that story? David, David is an adulterer. David has relations outside of marriage. And so he takes this woman that wasn't his, it was the wife of somebody else, sleeps with her, she gets pregnant, and his, his brilliant idea was, well, let's make this look like her husband had come home from the battlefield and they had gotten together and, and they would have kids. What he didn't count on is that the soldier fighting for him in the field was more loyal than he was. And so he comes home and he says, there's no way I'm going to go to my wife because all of my fellow soldiers are given their lives on the battlefield. If the king wants to see me, I'll sleep at his doorstep. And so he comes in. And so that doesn't work. And so, so David, the next step is, well, I've got to get rid of the evidence. I've got to get rid of this, this problem somehow. And so he decides the best way to do that is to get rid of the husband, to take the husband out of the picture. And do you remember that story, the order he gave? What kind of a person, what kind of a heart must you have at that moment when you make an order that the whole front line press forward and attack and at a given sound they all withdraw except for the one guy? What's going on in your heart? Wickedness. Wickedness. Covering up. Doing, and I know that's an extreme situation. I know most of us, you know, we're not going to go to that extreme to try to cover up our sin. But we'll do everything we kind of can to cover it up, smooth it over, ignore it, make sure nobody sees it. And in the meantime, we're asking, well, why do I feel so detached and distanced and down from God? And God, I just want to be renewed. How well would that prayer have gone? If David said, I don't really feel good about me, God, make me feel better. Without saying, Clean me up. Scour my heart. Clean me up. He knew, David realized, he came to a place where he knew he needed cleansing and renewal and that change came from God and it started with himself. He, it wasn't based on his circumstances. I'm going to tell you right now, guys, and, and, and this isn't, we're human and I do this as, as well as all of you do, but it's interesting to hear the way, listen to the way you pray sometime. Or, or better yet, pray with somebody and have them be at least open and honest to share with you the, how the majority of sometimes our prayer time has to do a lot with removing difficulty and circumstances from our life and has nothing to do with God changing us. That we just want everything else changed. We want those difficult people changed. We want that difficult situation changed. And we never pray, God, clean me up and you change me because that's where it needs to start. We talk about we need revival in the land. That's where it starts. People are like, well, we need better politicians. Maybe we need to be a better public. Maybe we need clean hearts and right spirits. I want to, here, though. David pours out his heart, and then look what he writes in Psalm 57.7. Look what happens as he pours out his heart to God, and he gets the order right. He goes to the right person. He gets the order right. He says, clean me and renew me. Don't just cover it up. Don't just put you know, the, the new tub over the old tub. Clean me and renew me. And then he says this, when he cries that way and he prays that way, look at what it says. In Psalm 57, 7, David's writing and he says, My heart is steadfast, O God. And the O God this time isn't, Oh God, it's, Oh God. My heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. If you didn't hear that the first time, I will sing and give praise. Anyone know where David was when he penned these words? 
He had been delivered from his sin, and he's sitting in the kingdom, and he's looking out all over the people, and life is good. Research that. He wrote it in the middle of a cave when this crazy king named Saul was trying to kill him. Those are the words he wrote. How good were those circumstances? He was running for his life. He was living moment by moment. And and in that moment, he understands that it's not about his circumstances changing. It's about God renewing his spirit. It's about God cleaning him up and giving him a steadfast heart. Let me share with you this morning, I don't know what cave you may feel you've crawled into, but God does some of his best work in the darkest caves. It's okay that you're there for a moment. Just don't stay there. What was that book, Sister Ray Don? God Works the Night Shift. It, it talks about how oftentimes God's doing some of his most miraculous work in those darkest of moments. Can I share with you a really practical example about, oh, 700 years or so after David wrote this? There was a man who had been crucified on a hill, on a cross, and laid into a dark cave. And guess what happens three days later? God did some of his best work in a dark cave. Out, Jesus comes walking out of that. Let me share with you, it's a great example for us. God wants to renew your spirit today. And so if you find yourself kind of in a dark place, in a dark cave, trust God to renew your spirit in that moment, in that place. He will. But pray correctly. Seek him correctly. Quit praying to get out of the cave. And pray for God to do a work in you. Because that cave may be very well where he wants you to be. Another incredible place where a cave ends up in scripture is the story of Elijah. Depressed and defeated and down, he kind of crawls into this cave and says, I don't, there's, there's no one left but me. It's just me. There's nothing, to, I can't do anything. And out of that, God rejuvenates him. He renews Elijah's spirit in that place. So a lot of us, I, I think we, we're afraid as Christians to, to kind of walk into and, and, and to be in those places where it's just difficult and, and maybe dark for a moment. I think a lot of times we want to come to church and we want to be you know, happy, happy, oh, and, and if somehow you're in that place, that somehow you're not spiritual, that's not even biblical. That's not even biblical. To, to, co- to come together on a Sunday morning and say, hey, if you're really down and you're dejected and you're feeling just stretched and maybe detached from God, that's not spiritual. You're not a good Christian. That's not even biblical. God reveals a lot of times that he lets us go through those valleys because it's in those places that he wants to renew our spirit and let us rely once more on him only, trusting him and what he has for us and ahead of us. God wants to renew our spirit. He also wants to renew our mind. It's amazing how tied together our spirit and minds are. We can Spiritual battles to destroy our thought lives and vice versa. We can allow our thought lives to thrust us straight into the middle of a spiritual battle that we had no business fighting. No wonder the Apostle Paul writes these words to us. Chapter 4, verses 4 through 7, I'll read these to you. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Now, did he tell us, find joy in every possible difficult situation in life? Is that what he says? No, he says, even in those You've got reason to rejoice. You've got reason to rejoice. So rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. How many of you are gentle in the middle of difficulty and challenge? Answer, none of you. None of us. We try, but the true colors come off when we're around the people that are closest to us usually. Like, we can pull it off Sunday morning. You know, we got about two hours, maybe max, hour or so, depending on what time you kind of come in, to kind of play the game. And, oh, life is good. I'm fine. But you're pressed in. And then you get in the car, and it's just like, you know, and, and we're just at each other. I see, I see husbands and wives just kind of look at each other like, um, but that's what happens. We, we, because we fail to see a reason to rejoice. And because we miss that, we don't, there's no gentleness attached to us. We're on edge. And we can fake it for a little bit, but eventually, kind of the, the mask comes off. Let your gentleness be known to all men, all men. Not just those Christians you're gathering with on Sunday morning, that when you're out the door, you can be whoever you want to be and act however you want to act. 
all men, which would include your children and your spouse and your boss and your co-workers and everything else. So he says, the Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And listen to this. We talk about the spirit and the mind being so closely tied together. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, listen, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. What are the parts that God says he wants to guard? Hearts and minds. He doesn't say he wants to guard us from difficult circumstance. He doesn't say he wants to defend us from, from, from hardship. He says, the thing I'm really worried about isn't all that stuff. It's what's going on in here and what's happening in here. He says, that's what I'm most concerned about. By the way, does anyone know what Paul says in the very next verse? Listen to what he says. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, what? Meditate, think, dwell on those things. Don't tell me that God doesn't want to renew our minds. He does. If there's any area that many of us need to have renewed, it's our minds. We need a new way of thinking about things. We need a new way of looking at things. And it needs to be in a godly perspective. It needs to be not the knots and the messes, but trying to understand through faith that God's weaving a beautiful picture together here. He's putting something together of value. I want you to listen to Paul's passionate plea in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. He says, I beseech you, I beg you, I plead with you. I am therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that you body is a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And how does that happen? He tells us, don't be conformed to this world. Don't be conformed to this world. Don't be conformed to the way of thinking. Don't be conformed to the way of acting. Don't be conformed to the way of seeing things and how you see life and how everything happens that's horrible to you. And oh my gosh, it's horrible, it's horrible. It'll never be good again. It'll never be. He says, don't think, be conformed that way. He says, but be trans." by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We don't like that, you guys. As Christians, we, we live in this weird world that says, hey, if I'm a Christian and God is good, then why all of, everything that touches my life should be good. Jesus went to a cross. How good was that? But you know what? That was part of God's perfect plan to take him to a cross now, if he's going to put his only begotten son on a cross for his perfect plan, we should probably understand that difficult things will probably touch our lives. As far as I know, none of you have been hung on a cross yet. We should probably understand that difficult things are going to touch our lives. But it's how we perceive those. It's what we think about it in the middle of those difficulties. That is what's really worthwhile. It's, it's allowing us to go, wow, God, you must have a plan in this. What might it be? I wasn't going to share this this morning, but I just found out um, Friday on, on the flight back, a friend of mine got a hold of me, and uh, a young man that I've known since I was five years old, grew up on the soccer field together, massive heart attack, dies right there. We were classmates, graduated together, dies in his mom and dad's kitchen while they were getting ready to go to his grandmother's funeral. And, and, and as difficult as that is for that family right now, as they're hurting, and just they've already dealt with the death of, of, of one family member, now they're dealing with, and, and, and I don't know, I can't even put my, I, can't, I don't want to put myself in the place of where those parents are right now. They just buried her mom, and to think about turning around and burying your son within a few days, does I, I can't even wrap my mind around it. But you know one of the things I'm watching kind of sitting back and, and going, okay, God, I don't know how to make sense of this. But what I'm watching is the amount of outpouring of love and encouragement and godly, I don't know, just godly building up that's happening for this family who I know for many years tended to live a godless life. I don't know. 
I have to believe if God didn't want that to take place, he could have certainly stopped it, I suppose. But in the middle of that difficulty, it's interesting to watch God moving people into place into this family's life to minister to them and to touch them and to share with them the, the most needful truth they need to know. First of all, God loves them and he's got a purpose and a plan for them. And all they need to do is turn to him. It's amazing, uh, you know, how we can go through difficult things and how our, how our thinking goes, kind of there we go. Finally, God wants to renew your strength. We talked about how challenges and circumstances of life can sap our energy and our passion and our strength. And God tells us that he wants to renew this for us. But it's going to come in a different way than we expect. Let me ask you, if I, were to, if I were to ask you guys, and we're just talking about just normal everyday life, if I was going to ask you, hey, and, and there's some people that are here that could probably relate to this, hey, you need to get on a strengthening regimen. What would you do? You know, somebody, Tammy's like chomping at the bit. I can tell them. I know. Personal traders and stuff here. Jody, it's like, what would you do? You guys, you're experts, what would you do? You want to get on a strengthening, you need to get on, you need to be, you need to get some strength. You need to gain some strength. What would you do? Resistance, you need to lift some weights, eat healthy. You know what, I, that's, those are the kinds of things that we tend to gravitate towards. We, we tend to think about strengthening, and when I think about strengthening, I think about activity. I think about working out, which is true. In some ways, God strengthens us through some hardships and difficulties. But listen to this other thing, and I want us to see this, because God has another way of renewing our strength as well. Look what it says. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31 says this, But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. And then he goes on to describe what kind of strength we're talking about. We're talking about the kind of strength that allows them to mount up with wings like eagles and and run and not be weary and walk and not faint. I want to read this verse to you again, if I can, from the Amplified Bible because it just kind of explodes this out a little bit. Whoops, I'm sorry. Did I give you the Amplified? I didn't. I'll just read it. Put it in there. Sorry about that. It says, but this. It says, but those who wait for the Lord, who expect, look for, and hope in Him, shall change and renew their strength and power. They shall lift their wings and mount up close to God as eagles mount up to the sun. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint or become tired. For just a moment, just let that scripture just kind of sit on you for a minute. Because I don't know about you, but when I'm feeling spiritually weakened, I'm depleted, and I'm detached, you know what I tend to do? I try to do more. I try to work harder. I got to figure out a way to snap myself out of this horrible, ridiculous rut. I, I, I got I to figure out how to get out of this and, and feel rejuvenated again and renewed again. And, and I, I got I to do more. I got to be more. I got you know, to come to church more. I got to do this more. I got to do that more. And, and in a sense, God tells us it, it's not about that. He conveys the idea of trusting and waiting and resting with a purpose. See, there's a difference in how we rest. Rest can go a couple ways. We can rest and become lazy. We just kind of disconnect and we just sit down. Or we can rest with a purpose. And God tells us the purpose for the kind of rest he's talking about is so that our strength can be renewed. It's not to get out of the game, but it's to be strengthened and renewed to get back in, to step back in. And that's biblical, guys. Jesus did it on a frequent basis. He stepped away and went, whew. Now, but he didn't just do that and go, well, I'm sitting down. I'm, I'm just kind of done. He did it to, to recover from what they had just been through, but to renew for what was coming next. And that's what I see summer for us, a lot of times for a lot of us. We get busy, but it's a time to kind of refresh and renew and go, okay, I'm going to get a little bit of a rest but it's not because I shouldn't be doing anything or not because God wants, doesn't want me to engage. It means I just need to be refreshed. I need my strength renewed because right around the corner, God's going to have me engaged once again. There's a purpose to it. It's been interesting to me as we watch the journey we've been on with our rewords that we began with remembering. Remembering our Heavenly Father's faithfulness to us. Watch this, watch this journey, you guys. Just kind of walk with me through this for a second. 
This is where we began. And, and let me share with you, for the most part, these messages are directed at those of us that are believers. Okay? For the most part. I'll, well, hopefully we'll pull it together for those that may not be this morning. But for the most part, this has been directed at us, those of us that say, hey, we've placed our faith and trust and confidence in Christ. We know he's our Savior. We know where we'll live forever. We've, we, we understand that. But it's amazing to me. Here's the thing. When you, if you were to break Scripture apart into just, just major categories, I mean, obviously Old Testament, New Testament, but if you were to break it into another major subcategory, it would be this. It would be your way to God and your walk with God. And what's interesting is if you were to break it out that way, about a third of Scripture deals with your way to God. Two-thirds deals with your walk with God. So let me share with you, not, God is very interested in making sure people make their way to Him. He's, he's done everything needed, everything possible to make the way to him clear and concise and, and, and able for people to say, yes, I believe that by myself I can't resolve my sin issue, that Christ went to a cross to do that. And he, he, so he's done more than enough to make that clear in his word. But then after we've made that, he spends the next two-thirds of his word saying, hey, the walk you're going to take, the journey you're going to make, this ain't going to be easy. There's going to be some stuff you're going to bump up against because you're still in the flesh. You're still human. It's going to rattle your cage. And I want you to know, I, that stuff isn't beyond my control. But if it touches you, it's because I, I intended it to or I allowed it to because I have a great plan I'm working out. And you've got to walk with me here. You've got to walk with me here. And so he says, here's where we start. If you're in that place where you've just detached, kind of gotten disheveled and just kind of like, I don't know what we're doing anymore. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. He says this, he says, hey, remember. Remember my faithfulness to you. Remember what I've done for you in the past. While you may feel disheveled, don't disconnect from me. And then he says, once we've come to our senses, once we've remembered how much our Father loves us and how faithful he is to us, then we change our minds, we change our direction, and we repent. It's not about your circumstance changing. It's about your heart changing. He says, so once you remember how faithful I am and you remember how much I just absolutely love you, we change our mind, we change our direction, and we come back. Our relationship is restored. Then what happens? So maybe we do that. We remember how great our God is and remember how much he loves us personally we say that so much, God, he loves you. We kind of blanket, and he does. He loves all of us. We need to absorb that in personally. He loves you. I've shared with you in the past, maybe, I don't know, that the first memory verse I ever memorized as a child was a verse my grandmother taught me. And it was an easy one. It's one most of us have remembered. If you've been in church, around church any time, John 3.16, right? For God so loved. But you know what she did? When I was beginning to read that verse, and I memorized it, I you know, could roll it off my tongue pretty quick. There was a time where she brought me back together and said, Sonny, do you know what that means? Not really. I mean, it was a verse. We memorized it. I kind of, you know, God loves everybody. So the next time we walked through that verse, you know what she did? She had me change some wording. And, I, and, and it wasn't in a let's change the Bible kind of a thing, but to help me understand and, and, to, and to let the Bible really sit into my heart. She said, say it this way. For God so loved me that he gave his only begotten son that if I would believe on him, I will not perish but will have eternal, everlasting life. So I hope you remember that this morning. And I hope maybe that causes you to change the direction from poor me to oh my God. Is he not great? But then what happens? Then what happens from there? Now what? We'll let the Father renew us. I want to read you, I'm going to read you a story. It's not an original story. It's a story Jesus told. And then we'll close. In Luke, the 15th chapter, starting in verse 20, Jesus tells this story. And he talks about this young man who was still a, fa still a son of his father but had strayed and was down and was dejected. 
And beginning in verse 20, it says, And he, that young man, arose and came to his father. He had had a change of... He had, he, had, he had remembered what his father had done. He had a change of heart. He had a change of direction. He arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. And the father said, You're right. And I want you to sit there and think long and hard about what you've done. And I want you to just sit and soak in your guilt and in your shame and your depression. I want you to just sit there for a while. Is that how that reads? But the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put that on him. And put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. And bring the fatted calf here and kill it. And let us eat and be merry For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And listen to this last phrase in verse 24. And they began to be merry, rejuvenated, refreshed, restored, renewed, refurbished, whatever you want to use. That's how you get there. But it's a process. You don't go from feeling bad to renewal. We have an orderly God who's put a sequence of events together for us because he's a loving God. He says, I want you back, but here's how this works. For your good, for your growth, and for God's glory. He says, you begin that process. And too many of us, and I'm guilty of it, you guys, I get in that place where, man, it's just not going well, and I'm just struggling, and God, just make me feel good again. Make me feel right again. God, change my strength then life will be fine again. God, give me that job. Give me that money. Give me that health. Give me that obedient child. Give me that whatever it may be, and life will be grand. And God says, that ain't the way it works. What you need to do is remember who I am and how much I love you and what I've got planned for you. And when you remember that, start changing your thinking. Start looking at this from a different perspective. Change your mind. Change your direction. And when you do that, And he says, and when you do that, when you come back to me, I want you to know I am not going to put you and sit you in a a heap of shame and guilt. I'm going to renew you. I need that. We all need that from time to time. Those are the steps. So the question this morning as we close, which step are you on and which step will you take? Because I think if we were all honest, we'd say we all want to be renewed. I like that idea. I like that place where maybe despite circumstances, I can write words like David wrote, steadfast, my heart steadfast, I will sing and I will praise in the middle of a storm. In the middle of a storm, God, you're God. I will sing and I will praise you because you've renewed my heart. We need to quit being circumstantial, carnal Christians. And we understand that God has a bigger plan. He has a bigger purpose. And maybe even that difficulty he's put you in is because he has some things that he wants to not only do in your life, but some things he's trying to do in the life of somebody you're touching right now that you don't even know. Which step are you on? And which step will you take? If you're here this morning without Christ, I want you to understand you're here this morning by the grace of God, whether you realize it or not. God has been gracious to you. And you've had things in your life where God has already touched your life in certain ways. And maybe what you need to do more than anything is to let somebody help you or maybe you just need to think back on some of the things that you go, wow, boy, that was really a blessing. God's already been speaking to my life and working in my life. And so by doing that, you're remembering, maybe you're getting, for the first time, you're stepping back and going, hey, this whole God stuff, I think it's real. I think it's real. And, 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 and I'm going to change my thinking about it. I I believe God really is real and he really does want a relationship with me. So I'm going to change my thinking. But it's not enough to go, I'm remembering what God's done in my life. I've seen that. I'm going to change my thinking about him. And and, and it's a journey, guys. You don't get there overnight. But let me tell you, the next step is you take a step. You change your direction. You go, okay, I'm going to quit going this way in my own direction, in my own life, and doing what I think is right, even if it's not wrong, what you think is right. Turn around and go, I'm going to step to God. I'm going to step towards him. And through what Jesus Christ did on the cross, it makes that relationship possible. That you go, you know what? 
I'm not good enough to get into a perfect heaven and stand before a perfect God. And so I have two choices. I can either try to be perfect enough, but here's the downer. You would have had to have been perfect from the moment you drew your first breath to the moment you die without a slip to get into heaven that way. Anybody on track? Nah. So the other alternative, the only alternative, is what Jesus said. He said, I'm the way. I'm the truth and I'm the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. He says, so if you can't be perfect, you can allow me to be perfect for you. That when you stand before my Father based on your faith and your trust and what I've done, and I took care of sin, I took care of eternal separation from God, I took care of that already on the cross and in the grave, I rose again. He says, if you'll accept what I've done, then when you stand before the Father one day, you'll stand before God at the time that this life is over, and when you stand before Him, you will be covered not in your own perfection and how good you are, you're covered in God's perfection. You're covered in Christ's perfection. He's our advocate. He's our attorney that says, hey, I've got him covered. He's covered. That's repentance. It's turning from the direction you're already going and moving and turning back to God. And let me share with you, he tells us that when that happens, guess what happens to you? You become a new creation. You're new. You don't have to be renewed. You're new. There will probably be a moment in time if you continue to live this life where you'll need to be renewed. That's for the rest of us that are struggling sometimes. I don't know where you're at. I don't know what step you're at or what step you need to take, but I pray maybe you'll consider that this this morning as we close. Receive.